How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Do you know his name? I th I, Stephen, Stephen Fish, Fish, I believe. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac. Utter maniac. If God is so great, if God is so kind, if God is so benevolent, if God is so nice, why is there evil in the world? Why are little children, you know, dying from cancer, like you said? What people are really after is what is my stance on religion or spirituality or God? The Dean, the Dean Show! The Dean Show! This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, green is a peace. Now, my next special guest is no stranger to the show. We have a lot to talk about, my brother. A lot to catch up on. I miss this guy. I miss this brother. This is going to be a very exciting, informative, educational, purposeful, enlightening show, inshallah, God willing. Could end up being a life-changing episode for those who are open-minded and searching for the truth and meaning in life, going from meaningless to meaningful. Without further ado, my brother, your brother, Faraz Zahabi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, brother. How are you? <laughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Good. How's it going? Amazing. Thank you. Good to see you again. It's been too it, it's been hey, list, it's been too long. I know I know they got I know they got you locked up there in Canada. You guys can't move, but <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty rough here. It's getting better, it's getting a lot better. Now there's a new uh Omni Quran scare. So uh, you know, we're trying to keep it um, we're hoping it doesn't escalate like it did the last year. But, uh, yeah, no, the Canadian government is uh, very, uh, how should I say, uh, very adamant mm -hmm. about COVID. Uh, how about you guys? How's everything in uh, Chicago? I mean, same thing pretty much. Not as bad as uh, in, in, ca in Canada, but, uh, you know, that's a whole, whole different discussion, you know. It's, uh, it's crazy. But uh, alhamdulillah, I wanted to, uh, we have a lot to catch up on. I'm kind of going to be all over the place, no but, but uh, I want to get your, I want to, start off with this um this video and i want to get your reaction to it and from there we'll, we'll take off suppose it's all true mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by god what will stephen fry say to him her or it i will basically that is the odyssey i think i i'll say bone cancer in children what's that about how dare you how dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I would say. And you think you're going to get in no, on that? but I wouldn't want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. Now, if I died and it was, it was Pluto, Hades, and if it was the 12 Greek gods, then I would have more truck with it because the Greeks were, they didn't pretend not to be human in their appetites and in their capriciousness and in their unreasonableness. They didn't present themselves as being all seeing, all wise, all kind, all beneficent because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac, totally selfish, Total. We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. So, you know, atheism is not just about don't, not believing there is a, is not believing there's a God, but on the assumption that there is one, what kind of God is he? It's perfectly apparent that he is monstrous, utterly monstrous, and deserves no respect whatsoever. The moment you banish him, your life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living, in my opinion. A lot to unpackage here, but I think I, I, think I got the right man for the job. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want? To, where do you want to start? <laughs> well, do you, do, you, do, you need, do you need a minute to to, to uh, dissect everything? everything? No, 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 no. This is you a know, classic you question. This yeah, is a very classic question. You know, and I have a lot to say about. You're it. Are you familiar with this famous actor? Of course. Uh, no, the actor, no, no, but the, the argument, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but he's a pretty famous uh, actor, comedian in the really? UK. Yeah. yeah. What's it? Do you know his name? I, I think Stephen, Stephen Fish, Fish, I believe. 
Okay, no, I'm not familiar. I'm sure you know he looks familiar. I'm sure I've seen him on TV, but uh, no, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know he was an actor. If you ask me, what is he? I, w I would have thought he's on TV, but I don't know if he's. So people are listening to this man. I mean, this guy makes a statement, and you got millions of people who are listening to him, and many get influenced. Right. Well, you know he he's in he's taking a self defeating position. This is known. What he's what he's talking about is known as the problem of evil. Epicurus said, you know, he said, look, if, if God is so great, if God is so kind, if God is so benevolent, if God is so nice, why is there evil in the world? Why are little children, you know, dying from cancer, like he said? Why is there evil in the world? Either God doesn't care, he's not so nice, or he can't do anything about it. Either way, he's not a God. So if a God, if he was a God, if he was perfect, he would care and prevent it. And if he cannot prevent it, then he's not all powerful, therefore he's not a God. So in their mind, they're saying, look, there's, there can't be a God. But here's, the, here's where they shoot themselves in the foot. Here's where the position is self-defeating. And, and again, this is a very old argument, what he's bringing up. It's a very, very old argument. It's a very short-sighted argument. Is how would you know there's evil if there is no God? If we live in a cold, dead universe, if we're nothing but chemicals and, and, and particles, if we're, nothing, if we're nothing but materialism, if everything is chemistry and physics, it would be like saying sticks and stones are complaining about evil. If we are just sticks and stones, if we are just physics and chemistry, there is no such thing. If there is no God, there is no such thing as evil. By saying you see an evil in the world, you are admitting, you are admitting that there is a God. And this is not, not just me saying this is a rationalist throughout the, the ages. Because there is, without God, there is no evil. Without God, there is no right and wrong. If there's no God, everything is permissible. This is a classic quote here. Throughout, uh, I'm forgetting the author's name. But if ev if there is no God, everything is per permissible. There is no halal or haram. There is no good or bad. There's no evil. How come if we are nothing but machinery? How come this is the, the classic rebuttal to his question? How come if we are machinery? How come if we're how come if we are nothing but physics and chemistry? How do you even know? How come you're conscious of evil? This is the question. Now he has to have some introspect here. And he's going to say, look, I see the world as good and bad. But there is no, this is a classic uh, question in, in, in the works of Plato. It's called the, the youthful dilemma. Does God say something is haram because it's, uh, does God say something is evil or good because it has the germ of evil or good within it? Or is it evil or good because God said so? It could have been, murder could have been good if God said murder is good. He could have flipped it. It's relative to what God's opinion is. Or is murder in itself evil? This is a Euthyphroian dilemma. This man is saying, look, I see evil in the world, but I don't see a God. <laughs> there is no evil in the world. If the world is, if you are truly an atheistic materialist philosopher, it's a self-defeating position. There is no evil. Why do you think Stalin and Hitler could kill millions of people and then sleep well at night? Because in their minds, they didn't believe there was good or evil. Killing somebody, if I remove your head off your shoulders, it's the same as if I move this coffee mug from one place to the other on my desk. It's just, I took material and I, I rearranged material from one place to another. If you're truly an atheist, a human being is just a machine. It's like, it's like removing the wheel off your car and replacing it with another wheel or, or scrapping your car completely. It's just physics and chemistry. There is nothing else. By saying, by saying he sees evil in the world, this is what uh, Hume called, you can't get an ought from an is. The world is this way and now you're saying it ought to be this, this other way. So for instance, he sees a child with cancer and he's saying, look, it ought to be a child with no cancer. That child should have a perfect life. Hume is saying, look, if we're going to be atheists, if we're going to say there's no God, we cannot say ought. We cannot say this. the world should ought to be like this if we are atheists. So the fact that he's taking this position is self-defeating. Now, I have a lot more things to say, but I, I want to let you jump in on this. But it's interesting. He also, how, how is he connecting? He's talking about now the pagan gods also. He starts diverting and talking about these pagan gods. Yeah, I think he's trying to say that, look, the, the pagan gods weren't perfect. You know, they were more human than, yeah, than yeah. 
god of the monotheistic religion you know the god of money because the pagan gods were selfish they went to war with each other they, they were very human like so he's saying it's more it's more lo logical to believe in them right he, yeah he's yeah. saying that i think he's making more of a joke because yeah. Yeah. they're obviously not true but at least they're cooler you know they're they're more uh um i could understand that th those gods would build this wor world because they were selfish and they don't really, they don't really care too much about human beings Sometimes they like certain human beings and they favor them, and other times they, they dislike certain, certain human beings. And those are the gods that we made, just made human beings make up in their own mind. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. A, it's a, what we call a compounded idea. You, know, yeah. you take yeah. the idea of God, you take the idea of war, and then you make the, the war of war. war. Yes. You know? yes. So it's a compounded idea, and it's not, it's not a, an idea that's experienced in the world. So he, I think he was kind of making it a joke. He was kind of saying, look, don't tell me you have a perfect God because look at his works. Look at his works. Because you have to understand, like many thinkers, like Ghazali to Leibniz, whether they were Muslim or Christian thinkers, they said, look, the world we live in is a perfect world. The world we live in is a perfect world. Why? Because God made the world, hence it's perfect. It's your interpretation of the world. It's human interpretation of the world. That it's the lack of faith that gives us this imperfect a view now this is a very uh concrete islamic idea in my opinion when you read the quran the quran is telling you the world was made this way on purpose when when you see a child uh who has cancer like he mentioned there is a khair, like we say in, in, in islam we say there's a good in there that you don't see you'll see once you have the totality of evidence you don't have the totality of evidence yet but there is a wisdom behind it. There's something very good. See, he, he he's working from a faulty premise. Well, what's his name again, the, the gentleman? Uh, I believe it's F Stephen Fish. Let me double check. Yeah. Well, this this gentleman here, whatever his name yeah. is. I wish I could address him by his name, but uh, talk about. He's 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 presupposing. He's pre Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry. Okay. Stephen Fry. Yeah, not Fish. Stephen Fry. Supposing. The death is the greatest evil because he's an atheist he thinks look when you die the lights go out and that's it you can't have any more worldly pleasures therefore you've been cut off from experience you've been excluded from experience he's presupposing it's the end but what if death is not the end let's say death is just another dimension you enter another dimension maybe that child that died from cancer is in a place right now of comfort he doesn't know that he's presupposing the child's fate was a disastrous one he hasn't crossed over from life to death he's presupposing that and this is clear in the quran you know you're presupposing you it says you know it talks about martyrs don't say they're dead they're alive you just perceive it not you don't perceive it so it, it, the quran is telling you look don't presuppose you know everything don't think you have the totality of evidence there is more to come and that more to come if you have faith death to you is not so final so th this is a counter argument. Mm -hmm. He is presupposing something he has no proof of. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, for instance, if, if you imagine you, you look at it, your child, okay, and your child breaks his toy, let's say he breaks his toy, and your child's in torment because his toy is broken. You look at your child and you're thinking, look, this is just a, such a small event in your life. You're gonna get over it. Mm -hmm. There's so many good things coming your way that the parent, when you look at the child, you kind of smile that he's crying over his broken toy. You know you're gonna replace it for him like this. You know you're gonna make things better for him. And this is just a little bump in the road. And also it's gonna help him mature in a way. There's some good in this, etc. How you look at your child, the wiser men will look at you. And of course, God will look at us. When somebody dies, if your narrative is that's the end, of course, I understand he's tormented. I understand that he feels that way. I understand that he, he, he's having negative thoughts. But in the, in the believer's mind, in the religious mind, we don't see it as the end. So he's taking a different narrative and, a, and he's presupposing that narrative to be true. You know, in the Quran, it tells you when you're resurrected, when you live again, God's going to ask you, how long were you in this world, the present world we're in today? And we're going to see it as a very temporary amount of time. Oh, a day, maybe a day and a half. Similar to how you remember a dream. When you're dreaming, if you're having a nightmare, to you, that nightmare, you, you know, maybe the dream was 20 minutes. But in your mind, that dream was an eternity or it was, uh, you know, for you, it was a lifetime, let's call it. When you wake up from the dream, you're like, oh, 
It's just a dream. You don't lament about it. You don't wish that it never happened. No, you, you move on. It was a little bump in the road and there was something you can take from it. And you had an experience. You've experienced uh, a bad dream. So you appreciate your good dreams. There's some wisdom there that we can discuss. We can unpack later. However, you don't lament about it and say, why did I have this bad dream? I'm never, I never want to dream again. I'm never going to fall asleep again. I never want to experience, I never, I don't want to go on anymore because I had a bad dream. Mm -hmm. In Islam, we liken this world, the Quran likens this world as a dream. And uh, all, everything's going to be made right. Everything's going to be made right. This is what Immanuel Kant, you know, uh, that's why I was fascinated about Immanuel Kant because he was, his philosophies, even though he wasn't Muslim, he was so close. Like by using reason, he came, to, he said, he came so close to what things, what, what are said, things that are said in Islam, actually. And I was even more surprised when I saw his PhD thesis and he wrote on, on his PhD thesis, he wrote Bismillah Rahman Rahim, which was shocking to me. Wow. And, uh, you know, I tried this to... Was, who, who, who was this again? This was... He Emmanuel, said, Kant, Emmanuel Kant was, is arguably one of the greatest thinkers of all time. And he wrote on his thesis in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. That's correct. You know, so he talked about, about something which is fascinating to me. And m nobody really even knows why. Like, uh, we have, there's a lot of theories on why. And one of them is that he was very influenced by a, fr a, a contemporary of his, a friend of his named Goethe. Goethe is like, uh, they call him the German Shakespeare. One of the greatest intellects in history. And Goethe had incredible uh, reverence for the Quran. He absolutely loved the Quran. He actually, Goethe actually said, it's our duty to believe in the Quran. He actually wrote a poem about the Prophet. Like he was so adamant about Christian, uh, excuse me, Islam, that some, pe some people believe that maybe that's where Kant got this influence. And there's a lot of theories on how that, that uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that those letters got on his, on his thesis. But if you, if you listen to, if you listen to one of Kant's arguments, it's very Islamic. It's incredibly Islamic. He says, look, I believe in the sum, summum bonum. The summum bonum is the greatest good. And now this is very interesting. Okay, It's an extremely interesting argument because I, I believe it. It's, it's extremely, I mean, it's embedded in the Quran. Like you can't, you can't deny it. It's in the, it comes from the Quran. He says, look, I look into the world and I see a lot of evil. I see things. I see bad people get away with things. And they live in old age. And they die, and they die comfortably in their bed. It's not fair. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. I mean, he doesn't word it like this at all. I'm just kind of giving you a modern rendition of it. Okay. Some guy was really evil, lived a good, a good life, meaning he his belly was full. He had a nice house. He had riches. He had all the things of the of the you know that anybody would want. Uh, he can you know he had plenty of resources, and he died comfortably in his bed. But he was a bad guy, you know. He's, he abused the people. He was a he was a drug lord. Whatever it may be, whatever evils he he made his money with. And then he goes in the grave. And Kant is saying, it can't be how it ends. Kant is saying there must be an afterlife, and things are made just. Why did he say that? Like, how did he make that logical leap? He says, look, I have within me this moral law, because I can I I can see evil and good. I see good and bad. There could be no such uh, uh, a conscious experience without God. God put in with us a moral law. So he, he likens it to seeing something beautiful. Like he sees, you know, you see the starry skies above. The starry skies above are, are beautiful. Why would you see beauty if we're just, if we are just machinery, if we are just physics and chemistry, if we are just sticks and stones, so to speak, mm -hmm. if we are just valves opening and closing? There would be no beauty, there would be no morality, there would be no sense of good and evil. We are touched by something. And this is where I, I'll, I'll give you a famous agnostic. Because I, I, this is not just people who are religious that say this. Like, for instance, a famous agnostic said something uh, amazing, I find. He said something incredible that I think is lost on most people. He said, and, and this is uh, Thomas Huxley I'm quoting now. And they call him Darwin's bulldog okay? because he was very adamant about, about Dar Darwinism. He was the, or Darwin's greatest defender in his time. So they call him Darwin's bulldog. He said, look, <laughs> he says, he says the mind, the brain and the mind is like, if I took a, a lamp, you know, a lamp and I rubbed it and a magic genie came out. Imagine taking a lamp, just, it's just ke chemistry and physics. And I rub it and a magic genie came out. He says, look, if the brain, if, why is the brain a physical thing? Something that when it gets excited, a mind comes up of it. 
you have consciousness, you have all these inner experiences, you have this realm, this dimension, where good and evil exists, where morality exists. He said, look, this is divine. This is something outside of chemistry and, chemistry and physics. Now, in the Quran, the way it's explained, God creates Adam from a clay or mud or whatever you want to say, and then he breathes into him something very unique, his ruh, something something divine. We're touched by something divine. Now, that's how the Quran puts it, but you have a you have a first person experience of this. Yes, your body is an object in the world. We have a, we live in the world. We we're, we are sticks and stones to a certain degree. I am part chemistry and physics. Yet, however, within us there's something else. There's this thing that's alien. It's transcendent. And even Kant admits to this. Kant says, "Look, how do I have this morality in me? This morality in me is telling me that there's more. There is good and bad, and." the balances have to be, at the end of the day, has to be, uh, the debt has to be paid. If it wasn't the case, if it was untrue that there's a next life and morality, and why would I have this di- this inner this inner calling, this inner uh, experience? Sticks and stones could never have this leap. Mm-hmm. This is oftentimes called, uh, referred to in our modern day as absurdism. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Imagine... It's just another way of thinking about it. Absurdism, absurdism is another way of thinking about it. Imagine every human being, we're born with this sense to connect with something greater. What is the meaning of all this? If the world, if the world we live in had no meaning, it would be the greatest absurdity. It would be the absolute greatest absurdity. The argument to say that the universe, if we're just universe, if we're just chemicals and, and chemistry and physics, then we're just talking to ourselves. It's We are the universe talking to itself, meaninglessly. That is the most absurd idea possible. Mm-hmm. Because it would be like a robot becoming conscious and realizing that his existence is futile. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's referred to as absurdism. Yeah. yeah. I want to go, go ahead and, and connect, connect another, another term that's often used. So you have atheism. He's an atheist. And also... Uh, the statement that you believe, which uh, we can go ahead and substantiate, you know, that it's a, we'll get into that. Is this actually a true statement or is somebody covering up what's just intrinsically part of their fitra, part of their nature? So there's another term here by an old friend of ours that last time you were in Chicago, we we, we talked about uh, some of the things he uh, discusses. Uh, let's get into this and then we can connect the two terms. Often asked. Uh, and occasionally in an accusatory way. Are you atheist? You know, the only ist I am is a scientist. All right? I don't associate with movements. I don't, I'm not an ism. I, I just, I, I think for myself. The moment once someone attaches you to a philosophy or a movement, then they assign all the baggage and all the rest of the philosophy that goes with it to you. And when you want to have a conversation, they will assert that they already know everything important there is to know about you because of that association. And that's not the way to have a conversation. I'm sorry, it's not. I'd rather we explore each other's ideas in real time rather than assign a label to it and assert you know what's going to happen in advance. So what people are really after is what is my stance on religion or spirituality or God. And I would say, and I would say if I had to find a word that came closest, it would be agnostic. There you go. That's the term. So we got atheism, atheist, agnostic, connecting these two. And you're familiar with, uh, obviously, the scientists uh, we discussed last time, Neil. Yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson, of course, Tyson, uh, yes. is a very famous uh, figure. So people will think, how can someone who is deeply into science when you compare the Bedouin who's walking in the desert and he sees the footsteps, he's, he doesn't have the kind of degrees the scientist has, but he sees the footsteps of the camel and he knows, you know, no, he sees the dung and the footsteps of the camel. He knows the camel was here, right? And then if when he looks at the universe, he knows that, okay, this equals that there has to be a creator of the universe. And then a great thinker, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, you're asking me for signs, you know, of, of the creator, and you're blind to the, all the signs around you. They're all over. So how does this guy who sees, looks out into the universe, he sees all of this, and he doesn't see? Well, you know what? I, I, I respect his view. 
he's saying, look, I don't want to tell you what isms I, I'm closest to because then you're just going to label me. I understand. He wants us to unpack his ideas one by one. He wants it, you know, he, he's saying, look, you know, two scientists, we, we're an ist, but we don't necessarily believe the exact same things. Two Christians don't necessarily believe the same thing, per se. Two Muslims don't necessarily exactly believe the same thing. So I understand that point of view. It makes sense. Um, he's saying I'm agnostic. I understand why he's agnostic, because in science, you have to understand science is a, is a is what we call an epistemology. It's induct, It's based on inductive logic. If I didn't see it, if I didn't think, ultimately, ultimately, it starts with the senses. We have to see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, smell it. Fundamentally speaking, science is based on inductive reasoning. Then after that, we impose de deduction. Okay, so... They say, look, don't assume anything. You have to have a hypothesis, then an experiment, and then you make observations. There is a method to the way they, pro they produce facts, th uh, theories, facts, laws. There is a si they have a system. Now, the system is not, uh, there's not one definition to the system. Things can be more scientific than other things. You know, there are degrees of how scientific something can be, how much control they can have. They, they have a system, and in a system, you try not to presuppose anything. If you, It's trying to be as objective as possible. Objective meaning, look, I'm not trying to put my personal beliefs into this conclusion. I have this idea. I'm trying to prove it to the world. And I'm trying to say, look, I'm taking my own personal biases out. The more you can remove personal bias and subjectivity from a scientific experiment, the more it's considered to be scientific. So he's he's... As a scientist, he has to remove his own personal ideas and beliefs from his conclusions. Uh, so I understand and his point of view. However, philosophers, when we ask, what does science actually show us? What is science? Because, for instance, if we ask, you know, what is architecture? Well, architecture is a science. It's the it's the art. Let's call it the art of building structures. OK, great. What's martial arts? Martial arts is the art of defending yourself. OK, what is science? Science ultimately boils down when philosophers of science when we ask them, what is this animal you call science? What does it do for us? Well, it predicts patterns and regularities found in nature. Whatever we believe that patterns and regularities of the past will occur again in the future. So they're not talking, they're, they're, their job is not to talk about spirituality or God. They're not looking for God. Science is not looking for God. That's why science doesn't tell us anything about God, unless we go into the philosophy of science. Okay, now that's a separate subject. What does science do? Science is trying to tell us, here are the patterns and regularities we find in nature. It's, it's moot to science. It doesn't talk about God at all. It has nothing to do. You could be an atheist scientist or you could be a serious believer in God and be scientific. People conflate this all the time. Science is trying to tell us what medicines cure what ills. And that, that's just the science of medicine. In every, in every domain of science, science is trying to tell us these are the patterns and regularities we have in this domain. That's it. It doesn't talk about God. It doesn't talk about introspection. It doesn't talk about morality. In science, there is no morality. There is no, uh, you know, uh, there is no psychology. They're trying to remove psychology out of, again, sci psychology is a different science, but they're trying to remove any bias they can. So he's taking that approach. He's saying, look, I'm not trying to be biased. Therefore, I'm trying to be agnostic. I understand his point of view. But he must have a personal opinion. Now, if his opinion is, look, I haven't figured out whether I believe in God or not, that, that's fine. But science won't tell us necessarily. Because the thing is, look, do you believe that God is in the, in the dunya? No, we don't believe God is a bearded man above the sky. This is a very important point because many people super they, important point they, they, they talking go, about this because that many people go away from belief in the creator of the heavens and earth because they think he's some old man with a beard in the heavens. There's a meme online that says it's a it's an astronaut up in the up in the in the space and he's putting a sign up saying I see no god up here. Well, nobody believes that there's a god up there, up there above the clouds with a beard and a staff. You know, like that's why Islam when you when you study Islam, especially Islam in in Judaism, we tell you God is not in the dunya. You can look under every rock. You can look, go in the deepest ocean. You can go up in the highest heavens. You're not going to, God is not in a time and space living in a little hut somewhere. 
Nothing encompasses God. God is not part of the dunya. You know, it's not part of the, fle- the flesh of this world. So there, you don't expect scientists to find God in their hydron collider. Do you think, do you think they are influenced because we're creatures of imitation? And now many of the peers, and then I don't know if you've seen this documentary, uh, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Have you seen that ever? It's a really good, good documentary. documentary. Um, I'm familiar. Just... I might have seen highlights. I've, I'm not familiar with it too much, but I've heard so, that term before. And it, it, I think it's a Christian guy, right? I believe. I believe, I believe so. so. And they they expo- oh, yes. I've seen, is... I've seen a few extracts. I, I remember now. Yeah, they really, have a really, really good, good documentary. documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, it's, it's called, called... They it's... asked Richard Dawkins about the design. Uh, yeah, it's a really, it's good. A so really good, good documentary, documentary, and at the end, you see that people who argue for a creator, they're pretty much ostracized, right? They're not given a platform, they're blacklisted. So, do you think uh, Neil Tyson now, if he starts to come out and he argues, he's influenced by his surroundings, by his peers, which institution that's pushing out, you know, God from the equation? Even if now they found proof, they would suppress the proof, most likely. That's how the system is set up. Well, here's the thing. I'm a, I'm a nominalist, okay? Muslims are nominalists, but they don't know it. Ghazali was a nominalist. There's no doubt. You know, if you ask any expert on Ghazali, they're going to say, of course he was a nominalist. They erect one God or the other. So we say God, they say nature. Now, mm-hmm. Let me explain, okay? If I ask you, yes. I'm going to give you a little taste of nom- nominalism, okay? We hear that a lot, yes. Nature, I, I, I tell them, look, nature doesn't or, exist. It's a mother, mother, it's a God in your imagination. They'll say mother nature. It's a, it's a God in their imagination. Bring yeah. me, I, please, I challenge, I'm, I'm making an official challenge, okay? Any scientist in the world, bring me on to any podcast, let's have a civil discussion, and you prove to me that nature is an existing force in the universe. I, I, I'll, I'll be shocked. Like, it, please, I, I, there's no way to prove it. I, I've, I've searched the world for a proof. Uh, I've searched 3,000 years of philosophy for a proof. There is no proof. And anybody want to take me up on this challenge, please bring me on and uh, let's have a public civil discussion. And you prove to me that nature is actually a force out there. Okay. So if I ask you, if I ask you, Eddie, what is nature? A uh, hundred scientists, if I ask a hundred scientists in nature, he's going to be like, well, he's going to have to give me examples. He's going to have to go to what we call particulars. He's going to say, look, and this, by the way, is, is, is in the Quran. Okay. So uh, if, if people who've read the Quran are going are to be familiar with what I'm saying, you're going to have to tell me, look at that plant over there. You see that flower? Well, that flower is going through a process we call natural and this force behind it, this natural force. You plant a seed, you bury it, you water it, you give it this much, uh, 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 you give it these, these circumstances and so it start to flower and bloom. Over time, it's going to reach this stage where it blooms. And I'm asked, okay, so if I destroy every flower in the world, there's no more nature. They're going to say, no, nature is also that stream over there. You see that stream? Uh, nature is also the clouds in the air. Nature is also uh, the sunshine. Nature is also the stars in the sky. Nature is also the planetary bodies. Nature is also, they're going to keep giving me all these particulars. Now, when they say nature, when they say the word nature, they're making a collective claim, a universal claim to all these objects. See, uh, it's funny because Neil deGrasse Tyson was saying, look, I don't want to give you what ism or ist I am because you're going to make this collective claim about me. You're going to think you know everything of what, uh, how I think. You're going you're gonna to think I, you know everything about me. I want you to come and d- dialogue with me and let me give you what I think bit by bit so you can truly understand me. It's kind of, it's, it's, there's a parallel here. When you say nature, you're talking about all these things out there. You're talking about the desert sands. You're talking about the, 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 the rain, the, the the water cycle. You're talking about all these things. You're just when you say nature, you're calling you're calling upon all these objects. You're not truly calling upon a force. Why? Think about this. Okay, this is what I want to challenge all everybody out there with. First, you saw the cycles of flowers blooming, bloom planted. A new flower blooms that drops its seed on the ground then then the seed is buried again and then it blooms again you first you saw that cycle and then you called it then you added the label nature you didn't start with the idea of nature and then go out in the world and discover flowers and water cycles and wind and 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 planetary bodies no 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 it was it's the opposite the universal is dependent on the particular the universal nature is the universal this force that you're appealing to first you saw all the particulars, the water cycle, the wind, 
sunshine, photos, everything that we call nature. First, you saw the particulars and then you added the label nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Islam is telling you, don't add the label. What came before the particulars? What came before these particulars? What caused these particulars? It's not what you labeled the particulars with later. Because the word nature is a meaningless term. It has, it's just a noise we make with our mouth to label, to call upon all these particulars. Not an easy point for people to understand. Okay, it's, I, know, I understand how, how difficult it is to understand. Because when I first studied philosophy, I came upon these ideas and they were difficult. It took me years to contemplate and think about it and try to understand. You know, I'm not trying to uh, tell you guys that this is easy stuff to understand, but there are no universals out there. There are no universals in, in the, the way scientists present this. When they say nature, they're erecting another force out there, another God, another deity, another something mm -hmm. that we don't observe. Do me a favor. Ask any scientist to put nature in a test tube. They can't. It's a concept. Nature is a concept. We're asking you for particulars. Don't bring on your concepts. We don't want to hear about your concepts. You don't want to hear about our concept. We don't want to hear about your concept. Just tell us what the what the experiment's about. Tell us what tell us what's objective. The word nature is a subjective term. It is not an objective term. It is never observed in it is never observed out there in the world. It's a concept, it's an ideology, it's a philosophy we add on to what we've experienced. And it came after the fact. That's what's so important because don't forget the Quran asks you to look into the world and notice these cycles. But when you say nature, you're adding the label afterwards. When we say God, we're saying God was before the cycle, this force before the cycle. Because if I took out every particular in nature, let's say I removed all the planetary bodies, all the stars, all the, the water cycle. If I removed everything, you wouldn't know anything about nature. Your, your, your idea of God, your idea of, of this force, this God, this God, God you call nature, depends on these particulars. We're saying, no, God came before the particulars. That's why we call him God, not nature. We say God is something else. God is before the particulars. The particulars depend on God, not the other way around. Nature depends on our observation of particulars. If we didn't observe those particulars, if we lived in a totally empty universe, we wouldn't say we wouldn't have came up with the idea, of this universal idea called nature. You understand? Hence, God is saying, look, I'm before the particulars. The particulars depend on me. I brought them into existence. Nature could not bring anything to existence because nature is a byproduct. This is very important. Nature is a byproduct of the particulars, the particular things we observe in, in the world. Nature is a byproduct. We, the Quran is, is brilliant in saying, look, God is no byproduct of the imagination. God is before the particulars. The particulars depend on... Nobody, nobody says in, in science, oh, all these particulars depend on nature. No, nature came after. Your idea of nature is a byproduct of the particulars. Let's go ahead and connect now. We have the term atheist, and then we have the agnostic, and now we got another brother, a good friend of yours. I don't know. Well, I don't know if he's a good friend of you. You know him definitely. And let's see uh, if, how, if he's, he, is he being influenced somehow because uh, it seems like, uh, well, let's just get into the clip, see what you think. You and your beard, my friend. Oh, thank I you. have beard envy. What is it? Well, I converted. I'm now Muslim. What, what is the significance behind this, this you know, beard? I love it. No real reason. You know, I wanted to grow it out, kind of do like a troll. Thank you so much. How are you, Joe Rogan? I'm good, sir. How you doing? Oh, man. How am I? God is so good. After all the pressure, all the chaos, everything that has happened in your life up to this moment how good does it feel to be back to be victorious and to have that ufc gold around your waist right now hey you know what without god i am absolutely nothing all glory be to god well i converted i'm now muslim all right so alhamdulillah <laughs> so we got uh, everything encapsulated in one statement alhamdulillah he's praising the creator of the heavens and the earth it's a term that habib often uses after his fights he's not pointing to himself he's pointing up above to the creator of heavens and the earth and he's saying that he's accepted islam submission to the creator not the creation and i'm probably maybe he's just being facetious what are your thoughts on that when you see that but then but just one thing you have so you have now someone from you know uh, atheism agnostic to someone like john jose who's a believer obviously in the creator of the heavens and the earth 
Yeah, yeah but John, John is definitely a believer. I, I, I know he comes from a Christian family. I know his father's a pastor. I'm not sure if it's pastor or reverend. I'm, I'm not sure what level he's at or which one, which denomination he is. You know, I, I trained with John many years ago, so we've lost touch over time. I saw him recently, uh, um, was it this summer? I saw him this summer or this spring. I saw him. And, uh, you know, I only see the positive side. Like when I meet John, I, I've only seen, he's always, he's always been good to me and I've never seen him do anything bad. Now, I know he's done many bad things. But he's not, uh, you know, he's, he's had many troubles in the media, let's say. Um, but when he's, when I interact with him and with the years we're training together, he's never shown me that side, you know. So um, he's saying, Alhamdulillah, is he, is he studying Islam? I have no idea. I've lost touch with him. I haven't talked to him. I haven't had a deep discussion with him in many, many years. Um, now when I see him, we just shake hands, hug, say hello. I don't know what's going on in his personal life, uh, but he's been in the media for, for – <laughs> he's had some trouble in the media in the, in the past and very recently. So I really don't know what's going on with him uh, to that level. But it seems like – so you have people now uh, that are suppressing the fitra. You talk about – you know, you made a statement, which I – I would say I agree with you know this is uh, something that there there is truly there is no such thing as atheism or uh, no, no such thing as an atheist. Can you click? Can you can you can you elucidate on that? Yeah, because you know they tell me look they don't believe in my God. I believe I say I don't believe in atheism. I don't believe in nature literally because I believe when when they appeal to nature, you know they say, oh we're, we're you know Darwin proved that it's all nature. It's nature what do you mean oh evolution is just nature nature if you cross-examine it is just a, an idea it's a concept that is pre, it's superimposed on particulars it's a universal as we say in philosophy so for instance they say they say that a classic example neil degrasse tyson i remember watching his documentary i want to use his example so that it's nice and neat and i'm and i paraphrase his point he says look polar bears were let's say uh, excuse me bears were brown or black and then one day one bear had a genetic error, genetic mutation. They classify it as an error. But through a blind process, he became white. And it gave him an advantage for hunting in snow. Therefore, he excelled in hunting in snow. He passed on his genetics. Now polar bears exist. Polar bears had a genetic mutation, an error, they say. An error. And that error led to white polar bears. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. I'm putting it in a nutshell. It's... There's many more details to it, but they're saying, look, that was an error. The thing is an error, the word error is a human narrative. It's a human narrative. A blind process cannot make an error. The, the difference is not what we're seeing. What the, we, we, we all admit to the same facts. It could very well be that polar bears used to be brown and there was a genetic mutation and certain, polar, so certain bears became white and had an advantage I had an advantage in hunting in this in Arctic areas, snow, snowy areas, and therefore they they propagated their genes, and now you have polar bears. It could very well be. However, your story that it's an error, that I don't have to accept. That's that's subjective. That's your narrative. It's not found in the data. It's not found in the observation. I'm saying that God mutated that 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 DNA. That was on purpose. That was God's plan. God is the selector. God. God chose some bears to survive and some bears to die. Some bears had mutations that were not that were not uh, helpful for them in, in their environment, and some had uh, advantages. You know, the Quran calls God the selector. It it doesn't go against the Quran. It doesn't go against what we believe. It's the narrative. You're superimposing a narrative, and they don't realize it. Where is this narrative observed in nature? It's never observed in nature. It's observed in your own mind. Anybody who studies Kant knows that the reason why you call it an error is because of your own paradigm. Now, a paradigm, if you could think about it, is imagine you're wearing rose-tinted rose -tinted glasses. You would see the world as tinted rose. If you had blue-tinted glasses, you would see the world as blue. Your paradigm is how you filter out information, the narrative you superimpose. So that's why we ask what are the hard facts? Keep your narratives to yourself. Now, I can add a, a different narrative. That it, I can add a different narrative to the same body of facts. It doesn't make me illogical. I'm not denying the facts. So it, Muslims should never deny the facts, but we don't have to accept their narratives. Narratives change over time. And some narratives are weeded out and some narratives 
are uh, strengthened over time. To say uh, to say that it's a genetic error is actually log logically inconsistent with the term blind process because blind process has no intention. It's to say that nature had an intention. Again, they're erecting this God. They think that nature has this direction. If nature is truly a blind, blind process, there are no errors. They're, again, they're always they're always admitting secretly that there's an intention in the universe by saying there's an error it's amazing because in darwinism they say there is this random mutation again randomness i've talked about it in the past it's just another god they erect it's just more narrative it's not found randomness is never found in nature ever ever and it's hilarious because uh, science and, and mathematics tell us that the world is determined in determinism, there are there is no random events. They can't have it both ways. They actually contradict themselves at, at a philosophical level. That's why Einstein famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. The universe is perfectly determined. The universe is perfectly determined. There are no random events. So to say, if, if, if a biologist says, look, there's this random event, he's using that as an expression because if he means it literally, he's saying something that goes against Newtonian physics. Like he's violating Newtonian physics here. We can't have biology, we can't put biology over Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics is more certain. Now there are levels of logic, there are levels of facts, okay? All facts are not created equal. A mathematical fact cannot be likened to a, a, an inductive fact. Mathematics is more certain than inductive facts. There are there is a hierarchy of facts. A historical fact is not to is not as certain as a mathematical fact. A, a, a historical fact is not as certain as a an inductive fact, a scientific fact. There are levels of facts. Okay, if you study epistemology, that's what epistemology is. You know, how do we know something? How did you how did you get to this conclusion? What type of logic did you use? There are different types of logic. Most people out there in the world cannot tell you the difference between deductive logic and inductive logic. Something that's very basic in in epistemology. That's epistemology 101. If you cannot to tell if you cannot tell the difference between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning, uh, you shouldn't have an opinion on what I just said. You should not. If you're not a professional, you should not have an opinion on this. Inductive facts and deductive facts and historical facts and intuitive facts are different things. Scientists are giving us sometimes their personal outlook in life and they don't realize it. That's why I want to weed it out. Just give me the science. I, I want to make your, your conclusions even more pure. So, for instance, that gentleman at the beginning, his name was Steve. Uh, what was it again? Uh, Fry. Steven Steve Fry. Fry. He's saying, look, I see evil in the world. <laughs> That's his own subjective view. Okay, fine. You're calling this evil. I'm telling you, look, I'm telling you, look, I, I have the same internal experience. When I see somebody murdered, I have the same inner feeling. It's wrong. However, I don't have the same narrative as you that that person will never see justice, that death is the ultimate end. That's your own personal outlook in life. Don't superimpose it on me. Don't put your way of seeing the world on me. I don't put my way of seeing the world on you. Let's have a dialogue. An exchange point of views. You see it as the ultimate end. I personally don't think Adolf Hitler uh, escaped the evils of what he did by killing himself. I think Adolf Hitler right now is being tormented and he's paying. He's paying for all the evils he did. That's the narrative I live with. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think Adolf Hitler lived a luxurious life, he lived in a lap of luxury for many years. He was Europe's most powerful man. He went down, uh, you know, uh, you know, his last years in life you know he was pampered he was the king of europe yeah for, for many years he like i mean he lived in the lap of luxury if you think he killed all those human beings and got away with it you're tormenting yourself with that belief you walk around and you see the world as nihilistic and evil that gentleman stephen fry he's choosing unknowingly unknowingly he's choosing nihilism he sees the world when he dies when he's close to death, the, the life is going to become more and more unbearable for him. Look, in philosophy, we have, the, we have this thing we call nihilism. And atheism only leads to there. There are no other roads. There are two possible roads. The fitra, the natural religion that we're inborn, we're born with this something within us. 
and there's more to this experience that we're living right now or nihilism there are no there are no other options anybody out there who has a third option i dare you to bring it to me i dare you please I, i'm asking you to bring it there are only two options that man stephen fry he is unknowingly picking nihilism he will suffer exponentially over the years in his own mind because every the the better his life is i know he's maybe a famous actor he's rich the more difficult is going to be to leave this world because in his mind it's the ultimate end mm -hmm. in his mind the more beautiful though his life is right now the harder it is to get to be to part people who suffer he's going to envy that child with cancer one day he's going to be like you know what that child never tasted these luxuries i did and then it was ripped away from him for eternity he died at a young age i and as he gets older he's going to want to envy that he's going to envy he's going to be like you know what i wish i never tasted these pleasures in life i wish i never saw the beauty because being having it ripped out of my hand wow. is so painful That's that deep. i'm paying the debt for all this enjoyment i had all the beauty i saw there's a debt at the end when i exit there's a debt why because this narrative i live with is that the debt is it eternal lights out mm -hmm. eternal separation that's what they believe so there's going to be a time where he's going to have a mind shift. He's going to have a paradigm shift where he's going to be like, hey, I see the wisdom now in dying very young. I know it sounds morbid. I know it sounds weird, but that's because you're in a certain stage in your life right now. If you can try to have uh, uh, some introspection on how certain other people's lives may be at, at a certain time, at a certain time, you can have a paradigm shift. Like, for instance, in the Quran, it says, when God sends them on stormy seas, all of a sudden, they get on their knees. Now, now they're now they have they they're in touch with the fitra. Why? Because they're seeing the ultimate end, and they're like, "Hey, there's something beyond. There's something more. This can't be it." I see absurdism early on in this conversation. I talked about absurdism. That we're born with this inner yearning for something more, and we're, we human beings have a unique capability. Human beings have a unique capability that we're touched with the idea, the the capability to visualize living forever. Yeah. Human beings live in our minds. We live in the past. We live in the future and we live in the present. Mm -hmm. We have this ability to think of the future, remember the past, all while living in the present. No animal can do this. And we have this yearning to live forever that's put within us. We have this yearning within us. They're saying, look, I'm in touch with this yearning now. I see it clearly. All my personalities, all the experience I've had in life, in a second, because in a second, you have an eternity of wisdom flash before your eyes. And all of a sudden, you believe in God. That yet, when God, he hears your prayers and he calms the winds and he brings you back to the shore. And you think, oh, we lost our mind for a second. God is telling you, look, think about when you have these paradigm shifts. Your fitra, your, fitra, your, in, your natural religion, the natural religion you are born with, becomes glaringly obvious to you becomes glaringly obvious mm -hmm. and no logical argument can supersede that no scientific experiment can supersede that it's so it, this is what we call an intuitive fact you know it firsthand so i'm telling you th these gentlemen when they're saying they're atheists it's comfortable and popular to say it now but when they're on their deathbed we'll see, we'll see. their death their time on their deathbed will seem like an eternity Wow. wow, that is really that's that's really really deep for someone who ruminates over that what you're saying. And and I started the show. I mean, we're going to get into some really uh, powerful stuff, enlightening. And what you're saying, basically, at the end of the day, it's going from meaningless to meaningful. And it doesn't make sense to just live a meaningless life. Going back to, uh, uh, I have just a few more questions before we conclude. I want to get these uh, in, and they're going to be based around some of these videos I want to show you. But just to touch back upon the. Um, Champ, is he still champ? The uh, J John Jones? He's still the? Is he still the UFC champ? I think they stripped him from. Yeah, no, they stripped him from his title. Yeah, yeah. So he hasn't fought in a while, I believe. Uh, I mean, uh, no, no, he's not. He's not champ. He's not okay. Okay. But he, he was. He he. He's not retired, but they stripped him of his title. He's been inactive. I want to give just one example. How do you think if he had more of a structure, just like you have in training camp, you have structure. Imagine you go to a training camp and you don't have some structure, you know, no discipline, like how to go ahead and what to do from A to Z. I mean, it's not going to make for, you know, a good routine. And then at the end of the day to a good champ to becoming a good champion. But same thing in life, how Islam gives you structure. So do you think from one of the things, for instance, because a lot of the mishaps and I really feel sorry and bad for 
for uh, John Jones. We want the best for him. And when you see a lot of the mishaps have been around alcohol. And you talk, you talk about how Islam is saved. Ba- just, just one example. You can give, you know, so many, but just babies, you know, saving Islam, saving babies from, from being born with alcohol syndrome, which affects 40, 40 to 50,000 children uh, born in this country a year. But just if, if John Jones was able to have that structure that Islam gives him, right? And just one of the prohibitions is alcohol. You know what I mean? What do you think how that would affect his life and enhance him as a human being? I would say it benefits 99% of the population to not touch drugs or alcohol, in, in my personal opinion. Uh, I think alcohol is one of the most unhealthy things, both physically and mentally. Uh, it's, a, it's a curse on the world, in my opinion. If you look at the history of alcohol, it's been a curse on the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd rather be, I, 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 I hate, I dread to be in a room with drunk people. Um, they become inhibited and violent. It, and I think John John Jones's life could have been much better if he uh, had that paradigm. If he was completely disassociated from enjoying alcohol or drugs in any way, uh, he could have had a much uh, more um, uh, a successful personal life. Let's call it. But again, I don't want to judge anybody. I don't want to say that. Uh, I don't want to single out John Jones. I think I'll, I should. I rather say it in general. Let me let me take it back. In general, most people will have a more successful personal life and, and in terms of health for your liver, et cetera, if they never <laughs> came across alcohol or drugs, because it's a dependency, it's a social lubricant, right? People do it because they feel awkward. They feel, no, nobody tastes alcohol and thinks it's delicious. In my, in my opinion, it's the most disgusting, <laughs> vile, uh, at least in my, in my personal opinion, it's the most disgusting and vile uh, substance you can taste. You know, if somebody tasted that, I don't know how they could keep drinking it. And, it's, but people do it because it makes them more sociable. They have the courage now. They have this liquid courage to act and, and, and approach people. And that, that's what it is. It, it allows them to connect. They're connecting around alcohol. It makes, it's a social uh, uh, stimulus. But you can, have other, you can connect as human beings in other ways that are far better, far superior. And, uh, you know, anybody familiar with the history of alcohol knows what a curse. I, I, I can tell you that I think even alcohol might be worse than hard drugs for what it's done to the world. You know, it's, it, it was a curse on humanity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and when you study the history, this just amazed me, the story, when you look at when people, because obviously the prohibitions did just come in Islam and say do's and don'ts. But, you know, first, you know, the beginning was getting to know your creator. And then when you know your creator, you love your creator. And then you trust him that he knows what's best for you. And then, you know, the companions, disciples of Prophet Muhammad, when the injunction came down, you know, to prohibit alcohol because it came in stages, they had so much of a love and connection to their creator, the one and only creator of the heavens and the earth. And love for the hereafter, for paradise, that at the end of the, at the end, they were just, you know, spitting it out of their mouth. They swallowed it, they were throwing it up. They say the city, the, the cities was, was filled with uh, alcohol on, on the streets, you know. So I, I just think about that. And I'm like amazed, you know, with, with someone like him or others, you know, there's truly such a, a great benefit. And one other thing that you mentioned, if you can just clear it, and I'll go to the next point, how because oftentimes when he, people hear Islam, they think it's a new religion. It's something that just came with Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and all the prophets. But you talk about Islam came from the beginning, the concept, concept of submitting your will to the one and only creator of the heavens and the earth. And it's not based around a history, just like you had the JFK assassination. People are still trying to figure it out, you know, let alone trying to figure out, you know, what happened back, back two, two, three, three thousand, thousand years, years ago. ago. Yeah, let, let's let's talk about the hierarchy of facts. OK, the number one most certain type of fact is we call in philosophy intuitive facts. If I have a headache, I know it. Even though scientists cannot prove that I have a headache, they can they can put all sorts of electrodes on me. They can scan my brain. They can. I might be having a headache and they can't detect it, but they believe me. I have a headache because they've had headaches in the past. You know you have a headache, even if your IQ is. <laughs> you don't have to be a logician to know you have a headache. You know you have a headache. It's immediate. Then we have logical facts, such as you know mathematical facts, deductive facts, abductive facts. One plus one equals two. That's an analytical fact. It's true by definition. It's certain. It's, it's, it has a high level of certainty. Then we have inductive facts. Something is hot or cold. Something is tall or short. We can measure how, how long a football field is. Okay. 
we're all going out there in the world and we're using instruments and we're measuring the world. We're using inductive um, uh, uh, logic to see, uh, you know, how heavy is a rock? How heavy, how, how dense is this material? These are things we do by experiment. And then after that, even lower is historical facts. Historical facts are the most dubious because many things happen in history. Uh, um, uh, historians reported they contradict each other. They're completely wrong. One of them has to be wrong. One of them could be, they could be, both be wrong or one of them is, is wrong at least. There are many dubious facts in history, such as the assassination of JFK. We're, not, we're still not sure how JFK died. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're still not sure exactly if there was two shots, three shots. Uh, there are many competing theories. We had cameras, we had eyewitnesses, we have the top minds in the world trying to figure out what happened exactly to JFK. And we still don't know. We still don't know. Was it the man with the umbrella that shot him on the grassy knoll? We don't know. We still we still have th competing theories, conspiracies. Was that, you know, they, they found the bullet next to his body when he was in the hospital. Was that bullet put there afterwards, etc. They have so many competing theories. They cannot be certain. And that's with primary source materials. Now, a primary source material is, for instance, the footage of JFK being shot. A secondary source material is somebody who heard a story from somebody who was there. That person wasn't there. But he heard a story of somebody who he claims he talked to was there. That's a secondary source material. So there are degrees of even how, how certain uh, historical fact can be. So what does Islam base our religion on? It bases our religion on the first category, intuitive facts. The fitrah, the natural born religion, is within. Everybody is born on the fitrah. We don't want to confuse Islam per se with the fitrah. Because you could have never heard of Muhammad salam and the Quran and be upon the fitrah. For anybody who disagrees with that, read the Quran. What does it say? It says, it says tell the Christians and the Jews that Abraham was on the right path before the scriptures. Abraham was on the right path before the scriptures. Why? Abraham was upon the fitrah. He was already upon the natural religion. Adam alayhi salam was already upon the fitrah. Meaning, we are born with a religion. How do you know this religion? I know it the same way I know I have a headache. I know it the same way I know I have a headache. The Quran tells you, look, you didn't always exist. How did you come into this world? You're going to come into this, the next world exactly like you came into this world. Forget all your logicians and scientists and all that. They can never understand existence. Existence is superior. It's greater than any Neil deGrasse Tyson can wrap his mind around. I used to be non-existent and I exist now. The same way I came into this world, I'll come into the next. And that for me is a very comforting narrative. I don't see a child when he dies. I don't see it as the ultimate end. I see it the same way he came into this world, he'll come into the next one. How? I don't know. I just trust in God. Look how he created the dunya. I always like to tell people, imagine, think of this thought experiment. Imagine we had all the knowledge we have today. And somehow we were observing existence. We're just purely logical minds. We're outside of existence. We're just observing existence. Before the event of life, we're just seeing the planetary bodies form. We're seeing, we're seeing physics and chemistry in action. We're seeing the Big Bang. We're seeing the universe develop. And one of us says, look, one, one, one day there will be life. Billions of years from now, there's going to be this thing called life. We, have, we could have never guessed that by watching the development of the universe, a cold, dead universe. Uh, it, it would be in a hot state by then, but you, you know what I mean? I mean cold figuratively. There's no life. There's no love. There's no warmth. There's no compassion. It's just building blocks and chemistry. We could never imagine this leap from a cold dead universe, figuratively speaking, to a, a universe where there's contemplation, friendship, love, uh, the desire to connect with a higher uh, a being. We could never make that logical leap. There's nothing to bring us to that, to make that leap. Yet it does, it did exist, it did happen. Love, compassion, friendship exists in this world. Things that are outside of chemistry and physics, and we know these things, certainly, we know them firsthand. That's why when that gentleman is saying, when that gentleman, Stephen Fry, is saying, I see evil in the world, he's admitting, he's admitting already to the fitra, because there is no evil or good in the world without first admitting there's a God, because only God can make something good or evil. 
you cannot have good or evil. That's why Hume was telling him, look, if we're going to say we're atheists, we can't say ought. We can't say the world ought to be a certain way. We have to say the world is that way. That kid died. He's just chemistry and physics and leave it at that. Don't admit to seeing evil or good in the world. Because once you admit to seeing that things ought to be a certain way, you're saying that the summum bonum is true. You're saying that there's, there is a God. There is good and evil. There's more to the world than chemi chemistry and physics. You're admitting it. You're taking a self-defeating position. So for me, I don't believe that they're atheistic. When they say nature, they don't know that they're using an expression. They think they're saying they're referring to something that's literal, literally in, out there in the world. When I say the word nature, I'm using an expression to refer to a collective of things. I'm a nominalist. I, I challenge anybody out there. I challenge anybody in the world. But I only have three criteria. Three. And to come here and tell me that nominalism is incorrect. My number one criteria is that you understand the difference between inductive and deductive logic. Number two, you understand the problem of causation. And number three, you have a definition of truth because philosophers don't agree on the definition of truth. Meet these three criteria and let's have a discussion, a civil discussion, public, public one. You come here and you tell me that nature is something out there in the world. You come here and you tell me that randomness is something physically, literally out there in the world. It's incorrect. Randomness is part of your imagination. Uh, nature is part of the imagination. It's a projection of the mind. It's a projection of the mind. If anybody studied Immanuel Kant, he would know this. It's a projection of the mind. It's something you superimpose upon the world for the world to make sense to you. Now, I have, I have a thought experiment that kind of illustrates that, but it's, it's pretty long and it's, it's complicated. But in the end, ultimately speaking, ultimately speaking, uh, if we're circling back to Stephen Fry's point, He's admitting the world ought to be a certain way. So he's admitting there's good and evil in the world. And there cannot be good and evil without God. I want to get a couple, just a couple more before we conclude videos. And uh, this is this was very nice to see. I want to get your reaction to this from our from our friend, Mr. Joe. Look back in history, I see these sort of cycles of Errors of reason and yeah. then faith. Errors of reason and faith. Like the faith, you know, dark ages, then the enlightenment. Then, you know, it goes dark again. Like, you know, the Arab world was flourishing. They created, you know, algebra was named after Algebar. And they kind of, and then, uh, you know, Islam came and it kind of went to an era of faith and it kind of slowed things. Uh, well, you, uh, Islam originally was the, the they were scientists, yeah. man. I mean, they were, they, if you look at the, the early Islamic world, they were the ones that, were the most advanced at one point in history. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that were pushing mathematics and science and, and, and reason and logic. You know, it's just, it, it comes in cycles, man. It comes in cycles of suppression and dominance. And, you know, the, the real concern is uh, unstoppable dictatorships like China and Russia. And the, when, when there's no dissent and no discussion. And this is what we have to realize. It's yeah. really, it really is. It's uh, it's an odd thing because I think there's there's genuine beauty in most religions. Like right. you can you can learn a lot about human beings and the sort of uh, the way they they use ethics and morals in their right. life and what they've learned from their religion. Yeah, you know when you watch the Muslims uh, gather around Mecca yeah, and go around the that Hajj, circle. Yeah. If you don't think there's something kind of beautiful about that, yeah. amazing about that, they all peacefully get there, they all dress the same, and they all like move around this thing and show respect. Obviously, it's doing something for them. It has this profound yeah. effect on them. Yeah. I've got a lot of friends who are Arabs. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Um, I love them. They're awesome. Uh, there are some factions that say we got to go blow ourselves up and that's obviously some wrong. Some factions of Christianity the, that are like that too, right? The a hundred percent, absolutely, in America, right? And uh, I guarantee you, absolutely. if we were being invaded and attacked by Muslims all the time, it'd probably be some radical fundamentalist Christians that would want to do the same the, thing, right? That some some Muslim sects have done. Yeah. So uh, you know, the getting into the there's good and bad that come from religion when it's used by people to keep themselves in power and repress other people that's really bad yeah and when it's used to do unto others as you would have them do under you yeah that's really good um you know don't lie cheaters you know don't kill other people don't I, steal those are good those are good ways to run society uh th that was really nice to see i don't know if you got a chance to see that you know it was kind of a tur turn uh for the for the better what do, what do you think, I think. 
I love the fact that they're so open-minded, you know, that they finally started to differentiate between different types of Muslims, you know, the Muslims that are creating all the chaos are such a small fraction, they're less than 1%, they get all the attention. And a lot of personalities out there like to exploit that to try to create fear and pump their books and make millions off it. Uh, recently, Muhammad Hijab had a dialogue with Jordan Peterson, which I loved. I find that those two individuals did something so great in one podcast. They said, look, let's not let's be honest here. There were two individuals trying to be honest and have a civil discussion. They didn't seem to tr be trying to push a book or an agenda or ideology. They were, look, let's have a civil discussion. And I found it so amazing and so honestly precious that Jordan Peterson walked back his comments about Muhammad Ali Salam being a warlord. And they had, they had such a great discussion. And it's, it's, it's an absurdity to say Muhammad alayhi salam is a warlord. It's an absurdity to say. The conquest of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca is pure, 100% proof that Islam is a peaceful religion. Who knows the Quran better than Muhammad alayhi salam? I ask you, Eddie, who knows it better than him? Who? Who could interpret it better than him? Is there a single human being in history? Is there? No. He had the Quran at that time. He conquered his enemies. His enemies were his footstool. Mm -hmm. And he let them all not only live, but thrive. And he let them all be in peace. He said, today is a day of mercy. He conquered them without the sword. Without the sword. You name me one other human being. Don't you dare interpret the Quran. Don't you dare interpret the Quran any other way than the way Muhammad Ali Salam did. He conquered Mecca after a broken treaty. People have to know that the, the, the Prophet Ali Salam was living in peace with the pagans. They were sharing, they were doing a timeshare of Mecca at that time till the pagans broke the contract. And th this is bedrock history. It's embedded in the Quran. The Quran is telling you, look, they broke the treaty. This is why I'm giving you this special permission. It can't be a lie because the Muslims would have been like, how could the Quran say they broke the treaty when they didn't? The, the Muslims were living the Quran live at that time. They witnessed the broken treaty. The Quran came down and said, look, the treaty has been broken. This cannot be a lie because the Muslims would have been shocked. There was an event that broke, I don't want to go into too much detail, but that broke the covenant that they had together. And Muhammad, using the correct interpretation of the Quran, the correct interpretation, the only interpretation we have, there is no interpretation outside. No interpretation could supersede the interpretation of Muhammad alayhi salam. Would you take interpretation of any other scholar other than Muhammad alayhi salam, the prophet of God, would you take any other interpretation? No. How did he interpret all the verses of the Quran together? The, the accumulation of the Quran, 99% of it was already revealed at this point. What did he, how did he practice the Quran? The Quran? He conquered his enemies without a weapon being drawn. He conquered them peacefully. He let them keep their goal. He let them keep their riches, their property. He allowed them to leave or stay. He allowed them to leave or stay. No other human being in history did this except for Amr bin Khattab, a follower of Muhammad, and Salah al mm -hmm. When they conquered Jerusalem, they did the same thing. Why? It's the Sunnah. It's, it's how they interpret the Quran. They even made a Hollywood movie. What was it? The, uh, the yeah, Kingdom yeah. of Heaven. Yes. Yes. Don't you dare interpret the Quran for us. You know, uh, so many personalities, I don't even say the name. They say, look, this is how the Quran, this is what the Quran says. Look what the scholar said. Don't you dare interpret the Quran higher, uh, outside of what Muhammad did. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Muhammad's only expansive war in his, uh, he ever had was the conquest of Mecca. He went from Medina to Mecca. He expanded from Medina to Mecca only because a treaty was broken. If they never broke that treaty, the pagans would be there till today. Till today they would be there. Nobody should ever interpret the Quran outside of Prophet Muhammad's actions. He had the entirety of the Quran at that time, or let's say 99% of it. Nine, let's call it 98%. And he practiced the Quran. Nobody should ever dare to reinterpret it differently than what he did. Now, with what Joe Rogan said, he's correct. It, it is beautiful to see all the Muslims praying together. There's a harmony. Instead of gathering around alcohol, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we are gathering around God. Yes, that is our social lubricant. That is what brings us together. We have a system now. Look, if you want to be, if you want to be in the West and you want to socialize, well, you got to go to a club. Well, guess what? The number one thing that keeps the club funded is alcohol. You have to drink. If you don't drink, you're not part of the party. What? You don't want to hang out with us. You don't want to socialize with us. We have a different uh, focal point. 
And when Muslims when Muslims make sujood, when they, when they put their forehead on the floor, they're saying the, the, the significance of that is that, look, I know God is true. I submit my will to God. I'm submitting my intellect. That's when the, the brain, the intellect, is lower than the heart. Ghazali says to us, the heart, not that lump of flesh in your chest, but that inner experience you have, that inner point, point of awareness you have. When you lower your head and you put your head on the floor, you're putting your intellect lower than that, than the heart. The heart, you know Allah directly. You know God by the fitrah. You were touched by the sign of God when you were born. Now I always tell people, think about before you were you were released into this world. You know, when you were in your mother's womb, you didn't know your name. You didn't know the dunya. You didn't know about the world around you. You didn't know about uh, uh, eating, drinking, sleeping. You didn't know about the cycles of the... You didn't know anything. All you had was perfect unity in existence. All you had was this fitra that you lived, that you dwelled within. You were aware of this fitra. You were incubated in the fitra. Then you were released in this world. And now there's a million, thousand, uh, there's a trillion competing theories, such as nature, randomness, etc. These things, I didn't know them. I knew something way before them. All these things are encompassed within my uh, uh, ex experience of awareness. I had awareness first, and then these things are embedded in awareness. They cannot be greater than my awareness. And what was I aware of, of this one unity, this unbroken unity? We all know God before we enter this world. We all experience God before we enter this world. This is in the Quran. The Quran asks you. The Quran tells you, before you enter this world, you all gave me the shahada. You all said, God, you are one. You are one God. Now, you could take this literally or figuratively. Nonetheless, the Quran is telling you, you knew about God before you entered this world. So when you go to Mecca and you do sujood, you're returning back to this oneness. You know, in, in the Bible, in the Bible, the gospel, it says, they say that Jesus is claiming. They claim that Jesus said, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven till you be born again. Now, Christians have many beliefs on what this means. I think it's telling you, go back to the fitra. When you were born, you had a religion already before anybody told you about it. Abraham was upon the truth before he, the scriptures. We have this inner uh, religion that we're born with. That's why when you're born in this world, you're looking to connect. That's where absurdism, remember we talked about absurdism early on before. It would be absurd for us to be born with a religion and there not be a God. It's absurd to think about it. And I'm using the term religion loosely. The more accurate term would be the fitrah. It would be absurd to be born with this idea that you want to connect back to this oneness that you first came from, this eternal oneness. And there's a lot to be said about what, what it means. What does oneness mean? We can talk about this as well, if you have the time, Eddie. Mm -hmm. Because oneness, the Quran is secretly telling you something that you already know over and over again. Over and over again. That's why people, look, you can give them all the logical arguments you want in the world. They always end up saying, look, you know what makes sense to me? God is one. That's it. The Quran is telling you, look, the message is the message is going to be protected. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. You know what? The, the Quran's message is very simple. Oneness is so glaringly obvious. You can never pervert it. It's impossible. And I, I, I'll, try to, I'll try to make it more clear why. Because I think we all know it secretly. It's just hard to verbalize. It's very difficult, Eddie, to verbalize, but it's known. It's not believed. It's known. You know, if you ask if you ask a hundred Christian experts, who is God? It's a very complicated answer. It's a very complicated answer. Even those who believe in the Trinity have a different variation of Trinity. Even it's a very complex answer. You try to hand down a complex answer over years. The first 300 years, they don't, they, none of the founding fathers would agree with what we have today. They, none of them uttered these kind of uh, ideas. They, they, they matured over time. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex answer. If you ask the Jews or the Muslims, what is God? They're going to tell you, oh, God is one. That's it. It's simple. It's simple, man. We, didn't, we, don't have, we don't have a variety of answers. And we don't need a variety of answers. Just one. Just one. And, and, and this is very, very powerful. I'm going to try to explain why, but I, I'm, I'm trying to explain a very advanced and difficult idea. Um, you know, Aristotle told us, look, all knives have something in common. Okay, it's a classic example we've talked about in the past. All knives have something in common. 
If I show you a, a plastic knife, Eddie, you're going to say, look, that plastic knife has something in common with a metal knife. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. If you're referring to it as a knife, then it has the essence of knife. If I change the essence, I changed the thing. If I change its essence, I've changed the thing. If I take that plastic knife, Eddie, and I melt it down, and I transition, I, I reform it into a fork, you're going to say, look, that's no longer a knife. It no longer shares that one thing with that metal knife over there. It doesn't have that thing in common with it anymore. Therefore, it is no longer a knife. If I change the essence of something, Eddie, I've changed that thing. It's no longer that thing. Now, when, we, when philosophers ask, what's the essence of human beings? It's a very complex answer. Human beings are part physicality and we're part concept. Part, uh, part of us is a concept. So, for instance, a knife, I look at this, I look at this pen here. It's part material substance. Okay, it's part material. But it's also part concept because a pencil, it, it's a tool to write. Part of the essence of a pencil and the essence of a knife is that it cuts part of the essence. And a pencil has to write. If this thing doesn't write anymore, I would say it's a broken pencil. If I melt it down and turn it into, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a paperweight, you can say, look, it's no longer a pencil. It doesn't write. Its function is not to write no more. It doesn't do that. It, it, it's changed. It has changed. It is no longer a pe pencil. You've changed its essence. A pencil... Aristotle told us, look, it's concrete, it's material, but also you have to put a concept on it. It has to be a, a thing that's intended to write. And that's a concept. Cutting is a concept. You can't put cutting in a test tube. Cutting is something that's held in a mind. It's a concept. Nature, like we talked earlier, is a concept. You have to, you have to say, look, flowers, grass, rain cycle, wind cycle, uh, uh, airflow, uh, bon monetary, uh, planetary bodies. These are particular things. Add this concept to it, and there you have nature. Nature is part material and part concept. It's this, it's this compounded idea. It's two pieces you put together. Human beings are part physicality, part concept. I'll give you a, 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 a very classic example, and then we'll move on. Okay? I'll give you a classic example. There's something called the ship of thesis. Very important for anybody out there hoping to study philosophy. You have to know the ship of thesis. Thesis has a ship. It has 99 parts every day. One part is worn out and he has to change that part. After 30 days, he's changed 30 parts. Every day he's going out sailing on that ship. Every day he comes back, he has to change a new part. After 99 days, Eddie, that ship has been completely changed. That, the original parts are completely gone. It's all new parts. And that ship is still sailing back and forth. And everybody's referring to it as the ship of thesis. And then all those old 99 parts... I put them in a warehouse somewhere, and one day I, I put them back together, and now I have two ships of thesis. And I ask you, which one is the original ship? You'll be like, well, the new one is the one we've been sailing on. It has the history of the ship of thesis, but the old one, the, 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 the one you just made put together, has the original parts. And you're like, well, it could be either way. They, they kind of, they're kind of both the ship of thesis. And you'd be correct in a way, because the ship of thesis is a concept. It's a material substance out there in the world sailing on the water, but it's also a concept. There's a dualism here. There's material and there's concept. Now, what if I told you, Eddie, I, if I told you, look, there's only one pen, pen. There's only one. Because when I tell you pen, remember, you're trying to connect this concept to them because there's so many pens in the world. You have to say, look, they all have one thing in common. They all write. That becomes the essence of pen. But what, I, what if I told you, Eddie, no, 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 no. There's only one pen in the entire universe. And there's never going to be another pen. And there's always been this one pen. And this pen is unchanging. Now, if a pen, there's many. If there's many, and it's, it's, a, it's a changing thing. A pen could be sharpened. A, a pen can get old. A pen can break. It changes. It goes through cycles. Now I'm attaching a concept to it. It's no longer just a thing literally out there. If I told you... Uh, Eddie, how much does a pen weigh? We're going to be like, look, pens vary in weight. If I told you, pe uh, Eddie, what uh, what color is a pen? Well, pens come in different colors. You would have to say, look, you'd have to tell me, if you'd ask, look, there's pens out there in the world, but you have to be flexible. There's concepts that, super, that, that come along with pens. Okay? It's not objective anymore. A pen is a subjective thing. This is a very key point. A pen is now a subjective element in the world. 
A pen could be black, white, green, heavy, short, tall, sharpened, not sharpened. It comes in a variety of ways. However, if there was only one pen, one, this is the key point now, and this pen doesn't change, it never changes. And I'm telling you, it will never change. It has never changed. It has always existed. This is a divine pen. It's a divine pen. You understand what I mean when I say divine? It will never change. It will never erode. It will never need sharpening. Then when I ask you about this pen, now your answers can finally become objective. They can finally become true. Because anything I say of pens as a collective is subjective. However, if a pen is singular and divine, then it is objectively true. The Quran is telling you that God is one, unchanging, never will change, eternal. This is the correct definition of God. God could be no other way. That is the definition of a literal God. It is telling you that God, the Quran is telling you that God is literal. It is not a concept in your mind like nature. Nature is a concept in your mind because when I ask you about nature, to teach me about nature, you have to point. If I was teaching a child about nature, I would have to point to the 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 flowers in the grass i would have to point to the clouds in the sky i would have to point to particulars that's why in islam we're not saying god is a particular you're going to point to a, a, a old man above the sky mm-hmm. the cons our, our belief in god is not conceptual it is literal your belief in nature and randomness etc you always have to point to particulars god doesn't dep- god's existence does not depend on particulars god is literally true God is literally out there. That's why when you say nature, you're appealing to a force that depends on particulars and your paradigm and your imagination. We're saying God doesn't depend on our imagination. When all minds are dead, when all human beings die, God will still exist. This is what the Quran says. When all have perished, there will remain the face of God. God is telling you. He is literally true. And that is the correct definition of God. That is the only... That is the that is the self-evident definition of God. The Quran gets it perfectly correct. Much respect for what you were saying earlier. Just a couple more questions, and um, I just want to get in. Much respect for, like you said earlier, Jordan Peterson. I think this could be a, a great catalyst for others to open up their platforms and instead of talking about Muslims, talk with Muslims. Muslims. And it's really exactly. nice, really, really nice, nice to see a uh, Joe Rogan also. Uh, you know, watching the Kaaba and the Muslims going around, you know, practicing that pure monotheism. So, inshallah, this can be uh, a turn for the better. Now, just in concluding, because consciousness and then you have the soul. And then how would you answer this question for somebody who has been, you have one individual just kind of just went viral. And, and we can avoid this, but a lot of times our youth, you know, they end up gravitating sometimes towards these things. they inquisitive, they're looking, you know. But then you see the whole world opens up to individuals like this. But then you see the anxiety is through the roof. Like, for instance, in this case. So so about a week, not today, but about a week ago, I sold my soul. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, ever since I sold my soul, I haven't been happy ever since. You know what I'm saying? Um, hey, yo, man. Y'all ain't gotta believe me. It is what it is. I, I, like, I'm not even capping. It's because, listen, I had to do it. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, I had to do it because I was trying to make it. Like, you feel me? Like, <clears throat> and as of when I was, th- like, selling my soul, um, like, there was things that I could sacrifice about and stuff like that. And I sacrificed myself. I could have sacrificed anybody, but like, but when you sell your soul, you got to sacrifice someone that you really love. And I sacrificed myself and stuff like that. Someone who feels they've gotten that far, they've sold their soul. And obviously, if your soul is sold, you probably, you'll be dead. You can't sell your soul. It's, it's not yours to begin with. You don't have a title for it. Like, so what, what, what do you, when you hear something like that, someone who's sold themselves pretty much for fame, for fortune, but at the end of the day, it equals misery. What would you tell someone like this to, you know, and others who, uh, have you heard of this island boy? No, I've never heard of that. I've yeah, never yeah. seen that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. 
No, I, honestly, I, I've, I've never, I don't know who, the, is that a famous individual? Or? Yeah, these are the Young Island Boys who just uh, hit viral. They're pretty famous now. Yeah. Are they rappers, singers, or entertainers? Or, uh, they're, uh, they're rappers, rappers yeah. yeah. Rappers. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like, I mean, I don't want to psychoanalyze the guy, but. But then if you ask the youth, the youth who you want to stay away from this, even Muslim youth, you said, you know, the Island Boys is like, yeah, we know the Island Boys. <laughs> <laughs> You know, later today, I'm going to have to Google the Island Boys just so I'm not out of touch. Yeah. And I'm going to have to listen to their music and I'm going to have to kind of like, you know, try to understand like who are these people. Not because I generally, I'm going to be entertained by it, but just because I'm curious to know how did they get here? Like, look, I, I look at him and to me, he looks tormented. Uh, wow. You know, you look at his, you know, what what he's done to his body. Yeah. You can look at his his ability to communicate. Now, I'm sure he's a very talented rapper, but he's trying to express himself and he's trying to say, look, I sold my soul. Now, if he's, if he's, if somebody sells his soul, that means they they have nothing left. Mm. I'm assuming that's what he means. Yeah. He's got nothing left because our, the essence of a pen is that it writes the essence of a human being is their soul. Outside of our soul. What are we? We're just rotting flesh. Yes. So I think he's saying, look, because uh, you, you know what, Eddie, you know, you know, what's the greatest hell? In this world, the greatest hell in this world is to be a slave to your desires. Mm. There is no pleasure anymore when your desires have overrun your world. Now, imagine, Eddie, we, we, we talked about this in the past, but let's reiterate it to make it more clear. If I give you a chocolate cake, you might enjoy chocolate cake. You might enjoy it. And then I make you eat a second one. You're going to enjoy a little bit less. And I force you to eat a third. And I put a gun to your head and I make you eat a fourth and a fifth. Now you're eating chocolate cake and you're in torture. And I make you, I bring you a seventh and an eighth. And now you're throwing up and I make you eat a ninth. And now just seeing chocolate cake, you're, you're shaking. You don't want the same thing that once gave you pleasure is now burdening you. Why? Because in this life, first you have to suffer. You have to have a desire. That desire is a discomfort. When you relieve that discomfort, then you have this experience we call pleasure. This is in the Quran. For every hardship, there is a relief. For every hardship, there's a relief. The Quran repeats it twice. Because in this life, we're stuck in the cycle of hardship and relief. You're hungry, it's discomfort, it's a hardship. Then you eat, you're relieved. But guess what? There's hunger again. Hunger comes again, it's, it's cyclical. And then you have to relieve it again. And this world, we're stuck in the cycle of hunger and relief, hunger and relief. However, however, the one who is a slave to that desire, he can't control that desire. He doesn't struggle with it. He doesn't fight back. He doesn't limit how much he eats. He doesn't limit how much he consumes. He thinks that more consumption is better. He becomes desensitized to that relief. So if you're gluttonous, if you overeat, you never allow your body to be hungry. You never have a Ramadan. You never recharge your battery. You know, the Ram Ramadan is a great antidote for depression. Mm -hmm. Because in the West, we have a lot of depression. Why do we have a lot of depression? We have too much food and drink. We have too much free time. We have too much pleasure. Not enough hardship. You know, uh, during the pandemic, they shut my gym down. The police was at my door all the time. Mm. Let me tell you something. I realize how much I love my gym. Like when I go in the gym, I'm so re-energized. I love it, man. I love my gym. Why? Because the doors are reopened. They're re I'm not trying to put my gym here at all. Please, please forgive me. It's just an example. A recent, a recent recharge I've had. The fact that it was taken away from me for over a year, the police were literally at my door, banging on my door, forcing me to leave the gym. Like I really it got it got that it, it was that bad. Huh? Not that bad. Like, in Canada uh -huh. it got really bad. And I was the I was the focal point of all the gyms in Montreal. Like it's a long story, but they were really after me particularly. And Literally, they came to my gym 16 times in the year and three times in one day at one point. Yeah, I had, a, I had a huge issue with the police. Like, they really didn't want me in there. They really, like, adamantly didn't want me in there. And it was such a difficult time. But now I really appreciate my gym. Every time I go in the gym, man, I, I'm like, oh, I, I remember how much I love to be here. And I think the West needs some of that. They need a Ramadan. The West needs a, a yearly Ramadan. The West a needs yearly, a Ramadan. You know, and they try to do it, Eddie. They try to do a, a sober November or something like that. I don't know. I, I forget. Is it October? Sober October. Mm -hmm. 
where they say, okay, we're not going to drink. I don't know if it's October or November. Forgive me. I'm not sure which one. But they say, look, we're not going to drink all month. We're not going to smoke weed all month. We're not going to do this all month. Even they see, even they see, they understand the prescription that Islam gives you. But Islam, what the beauty of it is, is we do it as a community. Look, we're all not going to eat. We're all not going to drink. We're all going to do it together. It's such a beautiful experience. Because when you're doing it alone, it's tough. But when you do it as a community, you re you recharge your batteries. You have a vigor for life. Chocolate take chocolate cake tastes sweet again. Coffee in the morning at the end of Ramadan. The one thing I look forward to is my morning coffee. I remember how precious my morning coffee is. You reinvigorate yourself. You know, uh, you know, even just stopping your sexual desires for a month will reinvigorate you. Will re will remind you. You know how precious uh, you know that experience is. You know between a man and a woman, you and your wife. You know, you reinvigorate yourself. The West is too hedonistic. Like that young man, he's fully tattooed. He's got a mouth full of gold. The worst thing that might have happened to him in his life is that he's been successful and rich because he didn't have the wisdom to control his desires. You, he seems like a young man who's already lived too much of life and he's desensitized because when you have too many women, Eddie, when you have too much pleasure, when you have too much abundance, what happens? Women is no longer pleasurable to you. Like, like chocolate cake, it's no longer pleasurable to you. Mm -hmm. Now you need something more. You need something more edgy. You know, the most extreme sexual type of behaviors are in the cultures with the most extreme amount of free sex. Because now a woman is not enough anymore. You need something so bizarre, so perverted, so uh, uh, extreme that you're like, hey, that's what it takes now for me to remember to feel what I used to feel. When a woman covers herself up, she's more desirable. Women have it backwards. They think they're more desirable the more they show. No, actually, no. The man now sees you as cheaper. Actually, after he has his way with you, your, your, his, his appreciation for you or your value in his eyes drops exponentially. This is what women don't, don't know. Men secretly desire you less after they've had you. The girl who makes a man wait shows him less. She has more power over his mind. There's nothing that drives a man more crazy than an unattainable woman. The women in the West have it backwards. It's unfortunate. And they have it to their detriment. They're valued less, in my opinion, because they, they, they appreciate it less. Why? Because they're had more easily. They've cheapened themselves in a certain way. Women is, a, a woman is an extremely precious thing. A human being is an extremely precious thing. Uh, food and drink, friendship, everything's, every, resources are an extremely precious thing. However, when they're had in abundance, when their supply is too high, um, their value goes down. It's just, just, you know, that's the fundamental, you know, you know the basics of the fundamental pr principle of economics. And I don't want to like a human being to economics, but there is a such thing as sexual market value. Yeah. Supply and demand. Too much supply, you know, too much supply, the man goes down. And, and it, it, it's, it's a shame that people don't understand this. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you go back uh, more in time, you can see that, you know, the institution of marriage was something that was held high and valuable. But it seems it's just deteriorating, you know, as we're getting more advanced, but just more morally corrupt. But you hit a, good, hit a good, 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 good point. Good point. Look, at, look at dysfunction in the way, like, like relationship, excuse me, relationships and in, I would say in the Western world have never been so unsuccessful. People are getting married less than ever and they're getting divorced more than ever. It, your likelihood of having a successful marriage, a nuclear family in the West is super low. Like if you want to have a husband, a wife and three kids, a nuclear family, which is the bedrock of civilization. Mm -hmm. you, you can tell how healthy a civilization is by how healthy the nuclear family is. The more abundant the nuclear families are, the more healthy the civilization. You can't build a civilization outside of a nuclear family. For instance, imagine imagine you have 50 couples. You have a civilization of 100 people. And each, you have 50 couples. So you have 100 people, you, you couple them, that's 50 people. They each only have one child. That means the next generation you only have 25 people. And you can only have 12.5 couples. And then that generation only has one, one child each. Now you're down to 12 children, 12 and five children, and so on. Now you can only have six couples. You need two, a couple, a male and a female, and three children for a civilization to grow and, and thrive. 
that has been severely hampered in the West. Why? The kids today are too, um, they're too bombarded. And it has a lot to do with social media because now today they don't have relationships anymore like, like we had in our generations where you get to know each other, you get married and you have children. Now it doesn't happen anymore. Now it's a hookup culture. Yeah. Why should I marry this girl when I got five other girls messaging me for the same weekend? So girls, what happens is it's called a race to the bottom, Eddie. A woman today who saves herself, she's competing with women who go out on a first date and have sexual intercourse with a, with a, with a man. So what they have to do now, it's called a race to the bottom. Women in the past, women in the 1920s, if you wanted to marry her, if you wanted to marry her, you had to buy her a house first. You had to ask her father for permission. You had to go through all these hurdles. And all the women held their own like this. All the women said, no, we're not giving any sexual relation to any man until he marries us, buys us a house, has a good job, etc. Ask my family for permission. My father has to like him. My mother has to like him, etc. Men had to jump through so many hurdles that they were on their best behavior. They reached for the skies. And when they got the woman, they appreciated her because the guy broke his bank. He broke his bankroll to have her. <laughs> he... It, he, he, he was a, it was a very difficult thing to get her. Now that he has her, he appreciates her. He's literally, you know, done everything he can. And now women, it's a race to the bottom. Why? Because women in, in the 1920s, if a girl would sleep with a man before marriage, they would shame her. She was ostracized. You broke this agreement we have with one another. We're not going to give men... A woman for for cheap women's value the demand was so high because the supply the, the the amount you had to do the amount you had to do to get a woman was so difficult now what happens is it's a race to the bottom the women instead of waiting three dates now they wait two dates and then instead of waiting two dates they wait one date and now they don't, you don't even have to take me on a date they call it netflix and chill just call me up or watch netflix and have relations it's become a race to the bottom the women have to give up so easily why because that guy has four other girls five other girls texting him it's a it's it's a moral race to the bottom, and what happens is now they've become uh, use once and destroy almost. Use her once and find the next girl. There's yeah. been an abundance. Now I don't want to single out women, but you know there, there's a lot to what I'm saying. But biologically speaking, biologically speaking, men are more hardwired to behave this way, but yet women now are behaving this way. Why? Because they're trying to keep up with the the demand. If you want to meet a man. You're competing with a bunch of women who are ready right now to send them nude photos of herself. Like it's it's just social media has like super. Uh, it, it's been a catalyst for the race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So try now getting married in this environment is a very difficult thing, you know. So that's why you know a, a lot of people right now they almost want to leave the West to go get married. They want to go into a, another country where it's it you know there's very few places in the world where this ha is not happening, but there are places in the world. Because marrying a woman now today is so complicated, so difficult. Yeah. I don't know what this, I, I can't remember the statistic, but like 80% of divorces have some social media reference in them, meaning that uh, it has to do with uh, infidelity and it arises from social media. I can't remember the statistic, it's like 70% or something like that. It's a very high level of like social media has affected relationships in the West, no doubt. Yeah, that's a whole different uh, topic. I mean, the 20 uh, million STDs, you know. Uh, not to, not to talk about the illegitimate children, the children's lives who are brought into this world, you know, by accident because of these uh, illicit relationships, and the list goes on of all the detrimental effects that it has on society. I was just thinking real quick before we conclude, it just had me thinking like, you know, it's all about, and you know this well, uh, as a um, someone who's coached some of the great champions like George St. Pierre and others, at the end of the day, like it's all about the after party. It's, a, you know, it's all about, right? And the fighter, but if you think about it, for people that say, oh, this is too hard, Islam, you know, all these do's and don'ts and whatnot and whatever, but the fighter, just this example with the fighter, you know, the fighter won't party before his fight, if he's disciplined, right? He won't go and party before his fight because he knows the kind of effects he's going to have on him he'll wake up for fudger no I, I mean he'll wake up for training right he'll fast no i don't mean fast he'll actually uh you know want to make weight so he'll be starving himself yeah, yeah. Right? right and he'll he'll exclude certain things include certain things he'll avoid certain foods i mean he'll pretty much like suffer tremendously 
for reaping certain gains. He'll put himself in uncomfortable situations, almost like torturing himself. Now, I just was thinking about that. Look at, like, for us now, like when people tease Muslims, oh, you, why are you guys not drinking? Why don't you go to the party? Oh, why are you fasting and all that? But you have the model, right, who's working for Vogue. She's throwing up. She's got to be fasting. She's, like, killing herself. So, but the after party for us is something that's everlasting, you know, to see the face of your Lord, to be in Jannah, the most pure place you can be. And God Almighty Allah is saying, the one who's successful, who purifies it, the soul. So we're trying to purify ourselves, our souls, so we can have the everlasting, not just the after party in this life that's over at a blink of an eye, but to get to Jannah, you know? Uh, now, imagine, imagine, look, Islam is functional. You're, you, what you're saying is, Islam, look, imagine all the ghettos in all the world. Imagine every ghetto around the world saying, look, we're no longer going to pay interest. How do bankers stay rich, Eddie? How do they stay richer than the rest of us? Mm -hmm. Interest. Interest, yeah. 90, over 95% of the world's income is made via interest. It's a massive amount. We will never, if you took all the money in the world and gave it back to the banks, you would still owe the money. Wow. When they, when they print a dollar and they give it to us, they give it to us with interest on it. You could, if you took everybody in the world, if you took all our money, Eddie, and you compiled it in a huge pile, all our assets, the gold, the Bitcoin, the crypto, and we gave it back to them, we still owe the money. You can never repay them back. Until you say we're not paying interest anymore, you will never, you will never pay them back. Now, imagine the ghettos of the world said, look, we're not going to pay interest no more. All of us collectively. Imagine you said all the ghettos of the world said, look, we're not going to drink alcohol anymore. We're not going to smoke drugs anymore. We're not going to fight each other anymore. Imagine they said, look, we're not going to have illegitimate children anymore. We're not going to, we're not going to allow extramarital sex. Like we're going to imagine what a world it would be. Mm -hmm. All the ills of our world come from all the things that are haram. Think of it. Imagine you go in the ghettos in America and you tell them, look, don't shoot each other anymore. Don't sell drugs anymore to one another. Don't pay interest anymore to these banks. Don't buy your homes anymore via interest. If we all collectively say no, to the bankers. They have nobody to collect interest from. They have nobody to sell houses to. Their market will crash. The house, the housing market will be for free for us. We'll, we will live, we will build our own houses. If they had this collective type of thinking, if we can unite them, if we can get them together, there, there would be many ills of the world fall by the wayside. Like for instance, the reason why, look, if you have to ask yourself, if you, if, if you, like, you know what I think is the greatest thing you can do in this world is, have a successful marriage with three children or more. That for me is the most important thing for me. When I die, I want to make sure I did that successfully. I had a wife and three children or more, and I taught them to be good human beings. Imagine everybody did that, Eddie. Imagine the whole world did that. There would be no wars because your children wouldn't go to war because they don't want to go into that other guy's country to break, to, to kill him, to take his resources. They don't love the dunya. They don't love the riches of this world. They're not so, they're not so impressed by your Fifth Avenue apartment. Mm -hmm. They don't desire it. You know, mm -hmm. you know, Plato said something amazing. He said, look, you can't be rich and be an honest human being also at the same time. Why? Because to get those riches, to have that Fifth Avenue apartment, I don't totally agree with him. Okay. I believe you can be rich and be an honest person. Okay. But he's saying, look, so many of, of, of wealth is gained by stiffing somebody else, by injuring somebody else. But if people didn't love wealth so much, if they were happy with just the basics, if they made their needs few, Eddie, and I'm I'll, I'm for pro I'm pro technology. Okay, I, I I think you should invent the computer because it's great and it it's I love the printing press. I love technology. I'm always for technology. Why? Because knowledge and speed of advancements is great. However, I don't I wouldn't invent the computer if I had the capability. Just because I want to live in a luxurious house, I wouldn't. You have to invent the computer and technology because you want to make the world a better place. Because you think you love knowledge. We look at this, Eddie. Me and you are sharing ideas, not because necessarily we want to make money. Of course, we all want to earn a living, but we love learning, don't we? We love learning. We love knowledge. We are lovers of wisdom and knowledge. So, if the whole world adopted this mentality. That, look, let's do what's best for building nuclear families. Okay, everything else takes a back seat. Then you'd have to take a back. Alcohol would have to take a back seat. Extramarital sex would have to take a back seat. If it's truly what's most important, if it's truly what you desire, 
um, you know, uh, selling drugs to my neighbor would take a back seat. Why? Because I don't want to poison my neighbor's ability to raise children. Also, I don't want to. I don't want the money that badly that I'm willing to poison my neighbor so I can have a fancier house. You know, because a drug dealer, that's what he's doing. He's poisoning his neighbor because he wants to have luxuries. I don't care how much you offer me. I will never sell or promote drugs and alcohol. Never. I don't care how much. You know what? You know, what, Eddie, uh, I get offers all the time from gambling sites. They want to promote on my social media. I, I would make more money than all my sponsors collected. These guys make so much money. Gambling sites will make, they make so much money. And I've been approached by huge companies over the years. I never even remotely tempted to say yes. Never. Inshallah, inshallah. Because what's what's gambling? I'm taking money from you. For me to be rich, I have to cripple your account. It, it's mm -hmm. such a, it's such, um, people call it fun if you do it responsibly. No, people get addicted to it and they ruin their lives. I find that, imagine the whole world said, look, we're not gambling anymore. We're not drinking alcohol anymore. We're not selling drugs no more. We're not paying interest no more. We're going to raise our children to be good. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. There's no amount of money to turn you into a liar. Imagine all human beings tomorrow. There's no amount of money that will turn them into a liar. There's no amount of temptation that will make them a thief. What kind of world do you think we'd be living in? We'd be living in a, in a, in a beautiful utopia. All the world needs to make all, all the evils that that gentleman in the beginning, Stephen Fry, was complaining about. All the world needs is for us to raise a generation of compassionate, just human beings. And that's the mission of Islam. Islam is telling you, look, raise children that don't lie, cheat, steal. Mm -hmm. And they're not greedy for the dunya. They're not, they're not dying to have that Porsche. When they see a guy driving by with a Lambo and this and that, you know, Eddie, I've made a lot of money in my life. You'll never see me buy a Lamborghini and show it online and tell people, look at these $500 shirt i have i will never do this i will never ever in my entire life indulge in luxuries why because that makes the youngster behind me he wants to get luxuries and you know what he's going to do what it takes to get luxuries why because he also wants his his media followers to no no he wants to be big on internet he wants his his piece of the pie what if you raise an in islam is is also has a mission Yes, Islam is divine revelation, but Islam also has a divine mission. To turn the world, to turn the world into a generation, to grow. That's why I always tell people, if you're Muslim, that means you have an oath to be the most just and fair human being. Don't forget, you have an oath, you took an oath to be the just and most fair human being possible. Now, you know, we all have our shortcomings. I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect. But I try every day to be the most just and fair human being. I can't. And this is the mission of Islam. Islam is telling you, don't pay interest. Don't drink alcohol. Make have it, breed a, Raise a successful family. Teach them not to be greedy. Teach them not to be violent. Teach them to be good human beings. Teach them to worry about the next life, not this life. They don't have a Lambo in this life. You don't want a Lambo in this life. You don't need it. You don't need it. That, that youngster I saw saying he sold his soul. He got the Lambo. He got the riches, but he ain't happy yet. He still mm -hmm. doesn't have what he wants. There's no, there, he still hasn't reached the, the what we talked about earlier, the cancer son and bonum, the greatest good. He hasn't yep. found it yet. There's no amount of Lambos, Eddie. There's no amount of, of women, Eddie, that, that doesn't take that desire for that, that, that greatest good. Human beings, don't forget. Human beings, we have the ability to picture life as lasting forever why is that why is that ability there you know we, we you know uh, thomas snagel asked that question he said look and he's an atheist by the way and that's why i like to use him he's a he's a philosophy professor he says look how come i'm thinking at this level if i'm just a, a byproduct of darwinian uh, mechanisms why do I think, why am I able to think about meta truth, metaphorical truth? Why am I thinking at this level? What does that have to do with survival and reproduction? There seems to be, the, and by the way, he's, a, he's, a, he's declared himself an atheist forever. Like he, he said, I'll never go back on atheism. No matter how much it seems absurd, he has like this emotional connection with atheism. That even if God came down and talked to him, he, he still has to be atheist. Basically is what he's trying to tell us. He has a blind connection. He has a blind faith in atheism.
But he says, look, it doesn't make sense that we're able to think metaphorically. It doesn't have nothing to do with survival and reproduction. We have this calling. We all have this natural religion that we can't verbalize. We can't point to it. We can't use. A, we can't come up with a mathematical formula to encapsulate it, yet we all know it. But Islam also has this mission, Eddie, and it's very important that we're aware of it. Islam is telling you to breed a generation of people, human beings that are just and that cannot be tempted. They cannot be tempted by Lamborghini, social media. They, they, they avoid all this. And that's, that's the beauty in Islam. We're, 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 we put humanity first. Not the individual. We put the group first. What's best for the group? It's not healthy for me to pay interest. It's not healthy for me to buy and sell alcohol. For, it's not healthy me, for the community. So I'm going to put the community ahead. I'm going to put my family. Ahead. You know what, Eddie, you tell me how many drug dealers have successful families. The kids grow up saying, hey, you bought, you, you bought me these luxuries in life by shooting and killing and poisoning people. He resents his father. As he grows up, he thinks, oh, my father's a bad guy, actually, if you think about it. Yeah. I actually don't want these, these luxurious things. Or my father was shot and killed or murdered or went to jail for 10 years. Now you tell me how's his relationship with his children if he's in jail for 20 years. Mm -hmm. They all end up jail or dead or hated by their own family. Why? Because they end up saying, look, my wife, she's with me because I'm a gangster and I poison people. And she wants that luxury bag so badly. She's willing to go out, let me risk my neck of getting shot, killed or put in jail so she can have that Gucci bag. Mm -hmm. You know, one time I had a student of mine come in, a really rich guy. And he came in with like a $40,000 gym Gucci bag. And I just took it. I chucked it across the, the gym. I was like, get this thing out of my gym. I was so gross. Like, I, you know, like, he's a friend of mine. He, he knows. Like, we know each other. Like, he's, he, he came in once upon a time. With, like, that, was the Gucci, that was the Gucci bag? I took it. I threw it across the room. I like, get this thing out of my room. Are you kidding? You're going to put your equipment? Like, he's so rich. You can put his dirty, filthy equipment, his stinky hand wrap. That's how rich he is. <laughs> and I just couldn't look at it anymore. I just took it. I chucked it. That's how my, how meaningless it is to me. I didn't ask him for one. You know, he's so rich. He could buy me one. He could snap his fingers and buy. I don't want it. I don't because they put the name Gucci on it now. You want me to pay the price? It's just basically telling the world, look how much excessive money I have. Yeah. Look how rich I am. I can spend my resources on this meaningless, meaningless object instead of helping the world. Look, let me just tell you guys how important of a human being, how much resources I've collected. I just took that. I just chuck it across the the, the cage, uh, the, the the gym. I I think to me it's garbage. Now look, I have nothing against people who want to wear Gucci. You want to wear Gucci? That's your business. But he was a friend of mine. I was trying to teach him a little life lesson. And, uh, you know, I think, I think me and him are, we're good friends. Okay. So like, uh, even though we have very vastly different perspectives, we're still good friends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, pr I promised you guys it'd be enlightening. It'd be really deep. We went really deep. You get, uh, a, a great bang for your buck here. Meaning that if you guys are true seekers, if you want to go from meaningless to meaningful, there's a lot to uncover here. You know, this is a, a lot of, uh, gems here. Thank you so much for spending the time with us and sharing, uh, reacting to some of these videos and um, sharing much of your thoughts and inshallah this could be a great great benefit for many to come inshallah God, God it, was, it was fun thank you so much thank you thank my you brothers. my brothers thank you